start recording of the actual podcast. Yeah. Okay, I'm now recording locally. It's very um, funny that you had a boat-themed nightmare. I was about to say, yeah. I mean, it was it was it was like a partial nightmare. I would Tragically say. Tragically on brand. Um, it was like it was unpleasant because I was, you know, being bombed by the Syrian Air Force on the Schuylkill River um, <laughs> while attempting to defend apparently only the west part of Philadelphia. That sounds not, like you, man. Not all of Just Philadelphia. Just leaving me to deal to go to, to go off Red Dawn. D- different on, autonomous on, on, communes on the Syrian fend, fending army. off Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Yankees are weird. <laughs> I, I would have well no I was um I was in a boat not a tank although yeah. you're being boaty <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what is a boat if not the tank of water hmm. is this a technical uh does, does it have any weapons on it it's just like a septa trolley with a with an anti aircraft gun mounted <laughs> on it yeah Roz's college rowboat with an M2 <laughs> Browning machine gun on That's it. That's basically what the Coast Guard has. So. Yeah. You would need a second. You would need a second. Uh, a second person seated, not rowing, um, in order. Well, I guess you, maybe you could give one in two seat. Uh, you know, some guns. One steers and one loads, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> when the rower with the machine gun is killed, <laughs> just going full enemy at the gates. But um, uh, oh, airport CEO, nice. Yes. Um all right. So anyway, uh so w- w- welcome to well there's your problem. It's, it's a podcast, podcast with slides about, with slides where with, we have uh, nightmares the, about the lion of Damascus bombing West Philadelphia. Yes. Yes, that was my experience this morning. Sucks. No, then I had to do an arms deal with a Russian arms dealer after oh, that like section in a dream of the nightmare. Or, oh, oh, okay, no, 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 in the dream. Uh, I, th- I, th- I thought you were just like confessing to some federal crimes just no, to no, spice no. the podcast up. But he said, what? I will give you the arms if you wear these women's shoes. <laughs> what? <laughs> Listen, I support said, whatever direction you're going with this. I said no. I'm going to find an arms dealer who will not make me do that. <laughs> Russian arms dealer just telling you to put on the maid outfit. And why aren't you in uniform? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to bu- purchase large amounts of weaponry from you. In order not, to fight. Not deal with your bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> in order to fight Bashar al-Assad, who again, like, I cannot stress enough, in your dream was invading the city of Philadelphia. Only West Philadelphia. I guess they got a no-fly zone set up on the other side <laughs> yeah. of the uh, <laughs> That's yeah, most of the liberalism, river. baby. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, they tried with North Philly, but uh, Kensington is basically Stalingrad at this point. Uh, yeah, like, Liam is Pavlov's house in a minute. Yeah, Li- Liam is like wearing like five bandoliers at the same time, and is like a, a hardened member of the North Philly Peshmerga. Yes. Welcome to Well, there's your problem. It's a podcast with slides where we discuss our various dreams. Um, <laughs> not like dreams like oh, I'd like to do this, but dreams like that's the fucked up shit that happened in my brain last night. <laughs> yeah, I, I had one where I had a nightmare where I got arrested for podcasting, which I don't know what the fuck that says. I but- was walking down uh, uh, the street earlier, going to the beer store, and a police officer really slow rolled past me, and Ooh, I was like, "Oh chills. shit, I'm, I'm I'm about to get arrested." For no, this podcasting. wasn't. This, this was this was different <laughs> for me. Like it wasn't like an incidental meeting the police. It was like a dawn raid. Like the police smashed my door down and arrested me for podcasting too much. And I was <laughs> like, "Well, uh, wait a second. For, okay, first of all, I'm not going to say anything, and I want my lawyer. But second of all, when did that become illegal? And then I woke up." So there you go. I had a dream last night where mm-hmm. I started an OnlyFans. <laughs> nice. Uh, but were you actually doing the OnlyFans, or yes, were you? Yes. Like, okay. I was. Yeah. Yes. I was. I was giving the people what they want. You gotta. <laughs> I, I, I think what would be a funny bit is even if you don't do it, to put start putting it in your Twitter name, like Liam Anderson, top point one percent OnlyFans, just to make oh. people look. 
I, I might, I might, and then there there would be no link, and I would drive people wild with indignation, <laughs> and then I, someone would cancel me for appropriating sex work. Oh god, so, because we can't have fun anymore. Yeah, and that's that's why I would get arrested for podcasting, and then in a sort of butterfly effect scenario, this would lead the Syrian Arab army to occupy West Philadelphia. It all ties yes. together. Well, Roz, congratulations. I'll buy you a K98. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have a point and click, buddy. <laughs> All right. So, welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters, which we're introducing <laughs> for the third time, this time properly. <laughs> right? Um, I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who is talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I am the person who interrupts the previous two attempts to start the podcast with a different, unrelated bit. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. It's Liam. Hi. Yay, I am Liam. Liam. O- Old Manderson on Twitter. Thanks to the one person who told me to change it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have redoubled my efforts to be mean to you in our YouTube comment section. I have started picking more fights on Twitter under my account. Hell um, yes. I am, just as a point of clarification, I am the person who opens the shit you people send to the P.O. box. (laughs) I have to mail Alice a package. And the address of that P.O. box is? P.O. box 40178, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19106. Uh, I I laid in down with parcels. (laughs) I uh, had to open 20 pounds of jelly beans today. Uh, someone sent us an anthrax CD. So, like, like, you people paid for this. Like, yeah, to own you. But it, yeah. they, they accomplished that. They made you haul back a giant anthrax plushie. Because you told kid- them not to them. send... One of them's for you. Aw, that's so sweet. For Roz. And Roz, someone sent you what I believe is an article of clothing, so when I see you tomorrow, I'll drop it off. When you oh, say boy. an article of clothing... No idea, I didn't open it. Made costume, made costume, hundred percent made costume. Made costume. Yeah. Made costume. It's Bro, the so fucking looks- Russian arms dealers. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Roz needs beer. World has to keep spinning. Deals happen. Promises yeah. are made. Sometimes uh, people do things that they regret, and they wear outfits for professions that they may not be in. I, I was about to say. I will say though, someone also sent us a rubber stamp. Uh I posted about it on Twitter. That is cool. Uh, I'm sorry you spent that much money on it, but rest assured, I'm going to abuse it until the yeah, end of gonna, days. You're going to yeah. stamp so many fucking things. Yeah. Yes. Um. So. Oh, my pronouns are he, him, if I didn't say that. I think you did, right. but whatever. Yes. Redundancy. Right. Redundancy. 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 <laughs> so, what you see on the screen is a very pixelated boat. Oh. Yes. I like that guy's tweets. Oh, <laughs> all right, yeah. That is that is a guy. I forgot. Um, Found a new guy. Yes. This is actually a less pixelated boat than that. Um, now, it does not seem as though there's anything wrong with it, but there is. Okay. Which is that it's full of incinerator fly ash, and they want, or Maybe it's not full of incinerator fly ash in that. There's a Schrodinger's trash boat. (laughs) Yes. Oh, we'll get to that. Oh boy. And I know everyone wants to talk uh, us to talk about the big boat, but today we're going to talk about a different boat. We are going to talk about the Kean Sea waste disposal incident. (laughs) Hell yes, we love a waste disposal disaster. Yes. Let's just say that we're in the. uh, Sanitation business, if you know what I mean. If you know what I mean, yeah. But first, I, I'm kind of scared to ask to know what you mean. <laughs> we investigate sanitation related disasters. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. investigate. Wait, investigate cause are paid off to avoid Whichever. things of that well, nature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're flexible. All right. But first, we have to talk about the goddamn news. I mean, all right. All right, so we, we knew have to, it was going to be this one. It's a yeah, long news segment, baby. It's a hell. It's a hell of a thing to happen on our week off. 
<laughs> yeah, we're back from sabbatical. Yeah, and we, we take a sabbatical, and look what you fuckers did. Yeah, in order to get our attention, the captain <laughs> of the I said, "Don't go." <laughs> of the ever given one of the largest container ships in the world, transiting the Suez Canal, drew a dick and balls. A perfect yes. dick and balls on the GPS tracker entered the Suez Canal and blocked it. Yeah. Just seems to have, uh, see, there was a big windstorm, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And Allegedly. While, yep. while countering the windstorm, apparently it got too close to the shore. And then I read this in a hydrology article uh, a couple of days ago. Apparently, Bottom maybe the dream. fact that the boat was too close to the shore made the uh, bow go hard starboard and just slam into the other shore. I mean, if I, this is the thing, right? If I had been the helmsman or woman of the Ever Given, I would be throwing out all kinds of hydrological bullshit. I would be like, yeah, no, it was the wind, uh, there were like, it was a rogue sea wave, monster. sea monster, yeah. mothman, uh, yeah, a guy just... shined a laser pointer in my eyes, yes. uh, anything other than I personally got distracted and I turned the thing too hard and I like stopped the flow of 10% of global trade for almost a week. I was about to say, yeah. Well, that's the thing is I don't know that you could intentionally steer this boat into the shore that that um that hard. Really? Yeah. Oh, you've already got to like like let down my accelerationist <laughs> dreams here. I kind of like the idea of someone just going rogue and being like, I have had it up to here with late stage capitalism. <laughs> yeah. Like that Ergo, United I'm Airlines gonna... flight attendant who like grabbed two beers, punched the fucking uh like emergency exit slide and which was, was out. Same vibe, but on a boat. I did the whole announcement also before anyone corrects you, it was a JetBlue flight attendant. Oh, whatever. I, so doesn't doesn't so. United own JetBlue? No, I important. have no idea. I don't. I don't look at. I try not to think about airlines. They're all incestuous anyway. Yeah. We, yes. We'll probably discuss this uh, in more in depth at some future date, and actually very soon on a Pod Damn America bonus episode. But oh, yeah. um, <laughs> which we'll be recording on the day this episode comes out. Uh, Only Pod. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, uh, but it, what happened is once the boat managed to wedge itself in this position, only I would say about three fifths of this canal is actually dredged to a reasonable depth, like you know from here to here. It's, this is part of an incomplete widening project, I believe, on on this side. Huh. So, you know they're 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 shoving bigger and bigger boats through this thing. Without like necessarily accounting for the hydrology of what might happen if the canal's too narrow, and you know the guy's not necessarily steering as best he could, whether mm. because of wind or because he's a Suez Canal pilot, which are apparently not very good. And they call um, it the Marlborough <laughs> Canal because you got to pay him off in cigarettes, which I think is cool. Like I'm sympathetic. That's absolutely I'm sympathetic to that. Yeah, take take the carton of cigarettes. Um, also the fact that like. For better sea keeping, all of these ships have bulbous bows, which I guess yeah. we can like John Madden in, but it's got a big protruding kind of like like if you look at my profile picture, it's kind of like my chin. It just like <laughs> um, and like that makes it more stable in open seas. Unfortunately, what it also does is um, if you decide to go ramming speed on one wall of the Suez Canal, it just gets stuck in there. Yeah, but I mean. The other thing is, like, I think all of this ship from about the R in Evergreen is, like, beached. Mm. Um, now, of course, this morning, they got it out. Yeah. Um, so a very cool video of, like, the crew of one of the tugboats, the, um, well, they Mashur. were fucking stoked. Yeah, they, yeah. Were, they were just, they were chanting Mashur number one, so, yeah, hell yeah. Uh, and dudes it's rock. also, definitely, like, if they hadn't gotten it out today, because today is high tide, like the highest tide they're gonna get get for a bit. If they hadn't gotten it out today, it was gonna be there for like probably a month. <laughs> <laughs> What's really funny is people like immediately as soon as this story broke were both identifying with and rooting for the ship. Yeah. I really appreciated yeah. that. I thought that was funny. It was the only good thing to happen on Twitter. Yeah, everything else, say, yeah. everything else that's on Twitter is like something mildly funny, and then it turns out that guy has been like Canceled starving for, kids yeah. in his yeah. basement or yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, fucking also, shrimp cinnamon toast guy. It's the biggest piece of shit you've ever heard of. Oh on for like God. 60 different reasons. For, for no other reason than apparently he's been trying to quote go viral for five years. Oh, asshole. Oh, Start a podcast asshole. like everyone else. Yeah. And then get a PO pie. box. And then maybe yeah. someone will mail you two 20 pounds of jelly beans. Do not mail us shrimp. Do you, not... Alice, do you want the jelly beans? Yeah, fuck it. I'll just exercise okay. more. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I mean, you're gonna yeah. have to eat the cost of shipping twenty pounds of well, jelly beans. But... I gotta ship you something else anyway. So okay, wait. No, made we're gonna for... send a we're gonna send a, a forty foot container of items you've mailed Not us to Alice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, I, it's, I, just, it's just it's just it's just like mm. a box being like this is taking a lot longer than I would have thought. I, I do <laughs> want to say that like um, the British tabloid press have been on this because the best newspaper in the world, the Daily Star has once right. again come back to their favorite form of journalism. How has this impacted the global movement of what they describe as sex asses? Um, you know, asses for sex, like a, yes. like a, a, a sort a of... A real doll, but it's a butt, yeah. Yeah, just the butt, just the ass. And apparently, like, if, if you were looking for supplies of sex asses, you were shit out of luck, because, like... So to speak. <laughs> yeah, because either they were, like, on this ship, or they were on one of the colossal number of ships stuck behind it and it genuinely caused like a, a mild supply panic in relation to sex asses asses for sex yes I suppose the asses for pooping which i assume also exist wait so you just have like a a fake ass that like poops, poops out of it what, what do you sex stuff oh, i guess no, so. I, that one's probably for kids actually they're into that gross shit you know Oh yeah, like why would every... you wipe something else's uh, well, something else's ass when you can barely wipe your own? No, no, no. Because like, <laughs> think about it. Like, if, if you've like seen kids' toys in the last couple of years, they're all like weird slime shit for some yeah, reason. Yeah, it's all slime shit. It, yeah, I don't know why. It's some kind of like conspiracy. I don't know, but kids yeah, have always like slime. That's true, that's but like, like, that's go, like go and find your own damn slime. Don't, it's too commercial now. When I was a kid, you just you fucking found or made your own slime, but now you got to buy this packaged slime. That's a good point. Yeah, they've they've gentrified slime. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it used to be you could just make it out of cornstarch and water. Now you got to go to the <laughs> store. Like you you got to buy you, slime. You used to be able to just mix all the stuff in the refrigerator together until your parents got mad at you. But no, now you have to like fucking uh, buy like a sixty dollar slime kit or whatever. My God. So anyway, I just want to say, uh, you know. Uh, if if you diverted to, uh, uh, diverted around the Suez Canal, my God, you, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah. lol. <laughs> lol. <laughs> Those guys We're betting heavily on it fucking up, and for once, no, never go in against Egyptian tugboat operators. I guess so. Yeah, I mean the the the, the backlog they're going through right now, I'm sure, is pretty gnarly. I read somewhere just before we started recording that they're um. Right now, they are only allowing livestock ships uh, through the canal. Um. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, there was one Russian warship that was stuck there in the queue. Russian warship number 545, <laughs> uh, which is, it, it, it's a tanker, it's a fleet oiler called the Kola, which genuinely, right, uh, collided with a bolt carrier a few days earlier, and so it was just stuck there with the ship that it hit, waiting. Like, hey guys, what's hey, up? Hey, How's hey it going? guys, how you doing? <laughs> Did you guys want some torpedoes? <laughs> <laughs> We're so sorry. It, incidentally, the name of the 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 other freighter that it hit is the Ark Royal. So you know, a little bit of a blast from the past there. Imagine if you diverted, you're probably about at Madagascar by now. I mean, oh, wow, yeah, that feels so stupid. It adds, how much does it add to go around the Horn of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, and then West Africa? 12 uh, days? About 12 days, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 there's a bunch, of, a bunch of pictures on Twitter of like, look at all this traffic going around the Horn of Africa. It's like, no, that's the normal traffic around the Horn of Africa, right? The Diverted Suez traffic hasn't made it there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they can turn around and go back, I guess. That might not be worth it, depending on how quickly the backlog clears. Uh, oh, and the Ever Given, uh, even though it's now moving, 
is not going to be out of the Suez Canal because they're just going to stick it in. Uh, they have a, a a giant basin called the Great Bitter Lake, uh, yes. which is for sort of like transit and storage and stuff. They're just going to stick it there and then like do some Marlboro involved safety checks to make sure it can even <laughs> make it up the rest of the way. I th- I was excited to see what would happen if they decided, you know, we have to we have to ship break this. You know, I thought they might have <laughs> yeah. to scrap it on site. You know, just because of how oh, stuck God, it was. It could have been, yeah. And I was like, that would bankrupt Evergreen, just because they'd have <laughs> to actually pay <laughs> decent wages. I mean, when I say decent wages, I mean more than, like, Indian dirt poor poverty shipbreaker yeah, wages. You would, you would have to, like, <laughs> ship a crane. Apparently, the, the crane that you needed for this had, like, a 60-foot reach, but it had to be able to, like, move a shipping container at a seriously fucked angle in order to make this work. And yeah. so, there was, like, I don't know, like, one of these, basically. And if you had to try to, like, do that, th- you're just taking all of those containers off, you're gonna be there for months. And yeah, it's because it, your big port container crane can lift up like, you know, uh, like a container every two or three minutes. If you had if you had to unload this with a big fat uh, regular crane, you're taking off like a container every, I don't know, five or six minutes at best. Yeah, <laughs> and it's got like hundreds and not the low hundreds. So more than that, I think this is like 20,000 TEU. Holy Fuck. <laughs> Maybe that's too much. <laughs> it's a lot of sex asses. Well, it's a lot let of me, sex Let me asses. double check this. 20,000 seems maybe a little high. That's nuts. Okay. Welcome to Well, There's Your Problem, the podcast where we all Google the thing that we just said to find out if we're liars or not. Don't worry about that. Ever given ship Wikipedia. 20,124 20 foot equivalent units. Holy shit. Fuck me. And no, you said, thank you. You said six minutes per. Probably. I, uh, at best, if people got really into the, uh, really into it. Because um, you're not using a specialized container crane at that point. You're using just a regular crane, which can't like, you know, because you're, if you're at the terminal, you have that specialized container crane, you're lined up, the, the thing goes out, it picks up the container, it brings it in, it drops it into a truck that stopped in the exact correct well, by position. By my calculations, that would have taken them 83 and a third days. Roughly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, that yeah, plus that was, the time to get whatever fuck sort right. of cantilevered over crane that you need. <laughs> so three, four months. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of overtime. Well, it's, it seems to be mostly 40-foot containers, so it'd be a half that time. Oh, okay. In, in, uh, in 2019, this same ship, due once again supposedly to high winds, Oh, okay. just fucking, <laughs> uh, like, uh, struck a ferry in Hamburg? Oh, well, that okay. strike. Yeah, <laughs> literally in this case. I yeah, suppose. just literally just gouged a thing out of the side of this ferry. So yeah, dudes rock. Um, Listen, huge just, fan of the Ever Given. Probably stop ramming stuff into other stuff though. I do. I do want to say to all you people who wrote, you know, uh, sexualized fan fiction or <laughs> made images of the Ever Given. I sent one of those to Roz. To this, in relation to this image. This ship is two years old, you fucking pedo. <laughs> oh. Age gap discourse cancelled. Yeah. Oh, I'm a child, am I? I'm a child. Oh. You know what that makes you? A pedophile. And I'll be scared <laughs> and I'll be dead if I stand here and get lectured by a pervert. Fucking nonsense. <laughs> nonsense, everyone. <laughs> And I mean, wedging yourself in the most inconvenient place and making everybody else, uh, making it everybody else's problem, is a highly two-year-old move. To be fair, this is true. Yeah, I, might be, like I might said, be three years old. old Laid down twenty eighteen, I want to say, or maybe mm-hmm. sea trials is twenty eighteen. I like how they they've it's, the ship's been around for three years and already it has like two near yeah. catastrophic <laughs> incidents. Yeah. That's that's not so good. <laughs> it inspires a lot of confidence in in, in the bridge crew. I think. Uh, well, I mean, no, I, nobody's in trouble so far. Like, that's the yeah, really funny thing. As much as everyone's investigating, say. like, the official line on the crew is like, "Hey, we're all really proud of them for like sticking it out." And it's like, yeah, no, you can be proud of all of them except one, the guy with the wheel. You maybe want to ask some questions before you're deciding if you're proud of that guy or not. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I think they're going to find out that you know maybe they shouldn't be letting ships this big into the canal. Before Can't the not. widening project is um, finished, 
Yeah, but Just I mean, like, it's big it's, truck scales, but for boats. Yeah, it's too much of a, like, it's too essential to the Egyptian economy that they, like, for them to just put a weight limit on it like that, isn't it? Yeah, but but they're like almost finished with the canal dredging. Oh, they, okay. they, they're through the hard part, which is widening it. They just got to dredge it now. Mm. So, you know, they may have to just put the kibosh on boats this big for like two or three years and then we'll be fine. But, you know, what? or they might just try and keep sending them through and, you know, this will happen again a couple <laughs> months from now. My favorite, my favorite tweet about this was, imagine being... The, the helmsman of the first ship, I think it's a mask ship, the one that this photo is taken from, to get through the canal after the Ever Given starts moving again, and knowing that you have the opportunity to do the funniest thing that any human being has ever done, that would merely be by funny. wedging your ship in the same place. <laughs> oh my god. Well, no, you couldn't wedge it in the same place. You have to go a little bit farther up. Mm, um, I guess so, because they've yeah. excavated. Yeah, because yeah, they excavated under the ship. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Also, be harder to do at high tide. Ah, oh, damn. Yeah, you could try, but if you did that and screwed up, oh, you're going to ultra jail. That would be. That would. It would just be highly embarrassing. <laughs> also true. Yeah. <laughs> One of some of the bit most embarrassment anyone has experienced in their lives. Now, I think the funniest thing you could do would be to like wedge it against the opposite bank. Oh yeah, that would be kind of fun. <laughs> Just to spice things up a bit, you know how. Yeah, it let's see. Let's see. Excavate that one, on board. Yeah, you board all the sex asses on board. You know. Yeah, absolutely. This is a record. I'm through my first beer before we're. Well, we had a long news segment. It's a long news segment. We're half an hour yeah. in, but like, yeah. but of course we are. We we had to talk about this thing because this, you know, this thing is perfect for us, and it happened the week when we took a week off. Yeah, and it's still not over yet. I, I prefer to do the episodes once the thing is over rather than while it's happening, because mm. otherwise it's just speculation. But yeah, but anyway. In fairness, we do a lot of speculation anyway. This is a good point. Yeah, but. I think that was the goddamn news. I used the long news drop there instead of the short one because we only had one news item. That'll do it. All right. So, this is the East Central Incinerator in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It does look like it. It does look like an incinerator. Oh, it's incinerating yes. the shit out of something. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. What do you say? I said, "What a depressing golden!" But my mouth was full of beer. Oh uh, yeah, I, th I th for a second I thought you were like you didn't just like not hear you were offended on behalf of the incinerator. He was like, "What the <laughs> fuck did you just say to you me?" Got some funny about to say, Ross? Yeah. <laughs> you got something funny to say about her? Huh? Huh? Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Huh? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Um, Tell oh, your boy. jokes. So in the 1960s. In Philadelphia, the city fathers had this bright idea to make waste disposal a little bit cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is rather than we truck it out long distances to be incinerated and then landfilled, they would build an incinerator close to Center City. Oh, oh smart. Yeah. yeah. I will say this is not a Philly specific phenomenon. A lot of towns and cities in Pennsylvania did this oh, around yeah. the same time, famously bankrupting Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> So the city acquired piers 31 through 35 and infilled them to create land for the East Central Incinerator. Um, the idea was this is a modern, clean, efficient, automated, and architecturally distinctive incineration facility, right? Because uh, it's kind of public-facing, right? Mm. Um, we're looking at the back end of it. The front end had some 1960s weird architecture on it, right? Huh. Um, you know, I put this thing in service in 1966. They had these fancy 1966 stack scrubbers, which took in millions of gallons of Delaware River water to make the smoke less bad. Um, they used uh, they used no outside fuel. Only, you know, forced air to burn the garbage more effectively. It produced, uh, I think, six pounds of fly ash for every 1,000 pounds of waste burned. 
and it could incinerate 600 tons of waste each day, right? Yeah, and then it's it's, it's not a problem anymore. Like, Obviously, right? <laughs> absolutely. The thing about burning stuff is it just disappears. Mm -hmm. As we know. Yeah, and they built a few other big incinerators in this era and upgraded a few older ones. The other big one they built was up in Roxboro, which is in uh, northwest Philadelphia. Um, kind of an, I wouldn't say affluent area, but, uh, you know, it's not, not, not a poor area. I was surprised they could get this built. But then they built this one right next to Center City. This is right at the foot of Spring Garden Street. So, you know, I guess people were stoked about incinerators back then. <laughs> stoked. <laughs> Yeah. Very clever. Ah. ah. <laughs> Damn, dude. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. <laughs> yeah. All right. See, it's funny because you can stoke a, a fire, which is what an incinerator is. I, is li true. I liked that joke. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a sad little crying bitch baby, though. <laughs> so I turned it over to our sad little crying bitch baby correspondent, Justin Rosniak. <laughs> All right. So the problem is, admittedly, when you incinerate garbage, you um, reduce the amount of physical waste you have to dispose of, right? Mm -hmm. but you still have to dispose of the fly ash, right? You know, you're six pounds of fly ash for every 1,000 pounds of garbage burned. Why is it called fly ash? You know, I have no idea. Huh. Oh, okay. This is, the, this is now the wild speculation segment of our podcast. Why do we think it's called fly ash? I think it's because the stuff that otherwise would have flown out of the stack. I was going to say, the stack well, scrubber had to is just it. pot ash. Yeah. Uh, huh. Flu ash. Flu yeah. ash. That makes sense. Yeah. Huh. Well, we're so, learning stuff today. The usual method to dispose of this ash is landfilling, right? Um, there's a couple neighborhoods in Philadelphia that were built on uh, landfill from fly ash, mostly from coal heating, right? A very notable one is this one right here, Logan Triangle, right? It's not supposed to look like that. It, it is not supposed to look like that. <laughs> um, there, were, there were row houses there. It was built entirely on coal ash, which had been put in a big pile to fill in a creek, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then once um, they sewerized the creek and then they leveled the terrain with uh, coal ash and then they built houses on top of it, right? And um, it, they had experienced such severe settling, they had to demolish the whole neighborhood uh, like a couple decades after it was built. Oh yeah, I love to go to Sinkhole Park. Yeah. Uh, this also happened in Mill Creek in Philadelphia, uh, or excuse me, in West Philadelphia, um, which uh, they, after they demolished the whole neighborhood, they then built public housing on top. Oh, good. Um, Which then, very occasionally, we get a massive sinkhole. Sometimes houses just collapse into the massive sinkhole in West Philly. Mm -hmm. It happens. Mm -hmm. We haven't had a proper... We had the sinkhole two years ago. Yeah, I was talking um, about the block of Sansom. Was, is it 4400, where the, where the shopping bag is? Yeah, where the Supreme that? Shopping yeah. Bag. Yeah, that was a whole yeah. block that collapsed into Mill Creek. You know, just, just one day all the Whoosh. houses fell in the creek. Which was, you know, sixty feet below grade. Yeah, <laughs> scenes in like great moments in um, out of sight, out of mind sanitation ideas of first of all just burning it, and second of all uh, just bury it in the ground. And we're about to yeah. hit the third one, which is just dump it in the sea. And that yeah. all like this is the trifecta of it's somebody else's problem now, and I really yes. appreciate that. <laughs> so. Another option, rather than landfilling it to make productive land, is you landfill it to make unproductive land, right? So, you know, you just build a big hill of trash and fly ash, and then you cover it with dirt, you repeat as needed, right? And this is the option they chose once they built the modern incinerators. Well, 1966 modern incinerators. They put all the ashes in trucks, they trucked it across the river, they brought it to landfills in New Jersey, right? New Jersey, Jersey. New, New Jersey is where you send your trash. <laughs> <laughs> it's really right? interesting to me the amount of science and engineering that goes into landfills, though. Of just like, turns out that if you want stuff to not like, you know, turn into a sinkhole or like emit a bunch of weird chemicals from shit mixing with other shit, you have to have like or a relatively. Fire. 
Yeah, you have to have a relatively good, like, sort of impermeable barrier between the trash and the land, and you have to have, like, pretty good segregation between different types of trash. It's like, yes. it's, to me, that's interesting, because um, uh, I, I have mental problems in the brain, but... <laughs> I want I want that New York City Sanitation Department general unif general's yes. uniform. Yeah. Yes, I do. I absolutely yeah, absolutely. I want to steal that valor. So this is um, you know, here here's an example. This is Kinsley's landfill. This is in Gloucester County, New Jersey, just across the river. Um, this is a big one which is going to be relevant. This is a lot of this is fly ash. Um, I think it's still partially active, but they're trying to put solar panels on top of it now because sure why not um <laughs> solar panel got eaten by a sinkhole cool, cool. Oh, cool. Well, there's a lot of uh near pensbury manor where william and hannah penn lived there's uh like a massive uh landfill right next to that too and i'm just waiting for the spoil tip to absolutely destroy uh william penn's old house because that would be <laughs> the most philly thing i can think of yes <laughs> so Anyway, they're trucking, they're trucking the ash across the bridge into Jersey, dumping it in landfills, right? Well, this is the 60s. In, in, in 1970, December 2nd, 1970, oh boy. Richard Nixon signs an executive order creating the Environmental Protection Agency. Wait, right? you, said, you said a date and it was a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, it was only a time it'll happen. Be only us. time it'll happen. I know, right? <laughs> only time it's going to happen. Yeah, the EPA is actually a good thing. You really could have freaked them out worse if you'd had a time in there. At 11.25am <laughs> on December 2nd, 1970, uh, the EPA so, was created. One what, what of the, what the interesting things about the EPA is because Nixon created it, he, he, he was just like, yeah, it's, it can fuck shit up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I think, not the case if any other president had done it. Nixon decided to do it. Decided to yeah, we'll give the EPA like some real teeth. <laughs> yeah, only well, Nixon could go to China, Roz. Yeah, I have an EPA challenge coin, which I really appreciate. Yeah. Just like being oh, like, yeah, with, yeah, with the environment cops. Yes. So there's sort of in the in the seventies, early seventies, uh, there's sort of a pollution crisis in the United States, right? Um, pollution pollution now is like CO2. It's like kind of abstract. It's particulates. You know, pollution back then was literally everything you saw was covered in garbage. Mm. Um, there's toxic chemicals everywhere. Rivers are catching on fire. Um, you know, you, you drive down the interstate and there's just a solid wall of garbage on each side I of mean, you. In some ways, that's almost more beneficial, right? Because people see that it's serious. Like, even to this day, like, I read this thing about Trump's environmental policy, such as it was, and uh, whether he believed in climate change. And, well, no, he didn't. But, like, the, like a lot of, like, rich dudes of his generation, what the environment meant to him and what climate change meant to him was having clean air and water, because that's a distinct thing that if you don't have them, you notice. It's there's fucking acid rain happening, yeah. or like the river catches fire, or whatever. Yeah, today when there's acid rain, it's from CO two. It's not from uh, yeah. There's much sulfur dioxide and stuff like that. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> we don't have acid acid rain. We will soon have acid oceans, but you know. That's probably fine. Well, that's fine. That's probably fine. That's fine. Probably yeah. fine. You, can't, you can't drink that water anyway. What do you the care? The thing is, right, what, what we've done is we've we've traded the kind of very uh, obviously bad and immediately bad pollution in most places. There's still places where we still have that, obviously. Yes. But like on a global scale, we've tended to trade that for the kind that's less immediately obvious, but when it hits a certain tipping point, kills all of us. And oh, I, yeah. I'm not sure that was the smartest decision that we've made as a species. Well, I, I think you need to get rid of the obvious stuff before you can start tackling the less oh, yeah. obvious stuff. That's true. I mean, I'm not. I'm know, not we, saying we have, like we. Oh no, just just leave the river to catch fire. Just as long as you never emit CO two. Just that it's somewhat more um, like abstract now, and that's not doing us yeah. any favors. Also, when the river catches fire, it will emit CO two. Oh yeah, that is true. <laughs> so. The EPA starts regulating certain pollutants, starts taking a closer look at what's being dumped in landfills and stuff around the United States. They drop some new regulations, so on and so forth. And suddenly, you know, having an incinerator on the waterfront 
uh, right near Center City where people live and have office buildings and stuff, uh, looks a little bit more like a dumb idea. Yeah, right? people start noticing that they're coughing because they're not all smoking seventy cigarettes a day. Yeah, they're out. they're they're coughing because they're they're inhaling their neighbor's garbage. Mm. That's so now we I, call that vaping. I yes. now live all of about five blocks from where this used to be. I was just thinking, man, I I'm glad there's not a massive trash incinerator there now. <laughs> also, please bring back the Seven Eleven. Well, it's still full of trash, though. Yeah, I know. I I, yeah, I do walk uh, down Delaware Ave sometimes, and I I see it, Roz. Yeah, the the site of uh the the site of the uh, East Central incinerator is now Festival Pier. Yeah. No. No. So I saw um, Kesha there once. Oh my god! <laughs> so and also landfilling garbage requires better techniques to make it safer. So um, in 1973, the Philadelphia City Council proposed to stop incinerating garbage and instead landfilling it directly, right? Mm -hmm. Which they were, of course, still going to do in New Jersey. Hell yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> New Jersey, New Jersey, the next city over in your game of Sim City, where you run yeah. the connection out to the edge of yeah. the map, and then Oof. it's their it's problem. A, I'm gonna import all the power, I'm gonna export yep. all the garbage. Yeah. I do not give a fuck about National Park, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Garden State. That's uh, where we send our fertilizer. Wink wink. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um so the thing is, New Jersey was suburbanizing rapidly after the opening of like, A, the Ben Franklin Bridge, B, the Walt Whitman Bridge, um, you know, and New Jersey Turnpike, a lot of other stuff like that. And of course, the sort of New Jersey, you know, horrible, horrible road network, which they built, which if you want to go way, way back to episode five, I think we talk about. Left oh, yeah. to their own devices, traffic engineers will always oh, yeah. build New Jersey. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and the new suburban New Jersey, New Jerseyans were fed up with being Philly's garbage dump, as well as being New York's garbage dump. But that's a different story. Um, yeah, they all went to Jay's elbow room to complain about it. They walked along the highway to the bar. Yeah. There's nothing good about your state or the people in it. <laughs> Tired yeah. of getting this New York garbage is mostly snitches. Yes. I am sick of I am sick of digging bones out of my <laughs> trash can. <laughs> so, yet a bunch of a bunch of protesters blocked uh, trucks from Philadelphia at the gate of the Kinsey landfill, right? And they started lobbying and agitating their lawmakers, and they passed the New Jersey Waste Control Act of 1973, which banned Philadelphia's garbage from New Jersey. So Philadelphia's Pussies. incinerators were turned back on. Oh, you're welcome for the jobs. Yeah. <laughs> and the economy you have because of us. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, oh you come here? Jobs, oh, jobs is what? Mudlocks? <laughs> no, jobs in Center City. Uh, oh, I, I noticed yeah, you like the Eagles. Say, they all... and, and you like the Sixers. And, and you like the Phillies. And you, like, you sure like the Flyers. Because you love screaming the N-word at the three black players on the ice. <laughs> They like having a wawa, as I you understand it. The fact that you just said having a wawa, having a wawa, yeah. ugh, <laughs> ugh, just so, no. There's it's there's quick a, trip there's, in Jersey. There's there's a, there's a process of cultural exchange going on here, and it can't always be pressy. No, that's wawa fine. wawa is has a presence in all of South Jersey. Yeah, that's so, what I, see, yes. I was right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. yeah, now, now a, if we can now if we can just get Liam to say that he's going out to Big Tesco. Uh, you know, hey, you guys want up. anything? Uh, <laughs> can I get some of those fancy? What's the other grocery store? Mark, Marks and Spencer. Mark and uh, Sp yeah, Marks and Spencer. That's a little bit fancier. Can or I like get a forty-pound salmon with the with the dressing that I have to order a couple days in advance? The really fancy one would be Waitrose. Uh, that's ah, the like yes. upper middle class one. That's like a sort of a Whole Foods kind of experience. I think. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too mm. trashy for Waitrose. Yeah, I went to the I went to the Acme a few days ago. Yeah, do you mean the Acme? No, the Acme. Oh yeah, you mean the a whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Philadelphia contested. Back on track. <laughs> Philadelphia <laughs> contested this act. They sued New Jersey in court. Right? Yeah, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the and night court theme, but for garbage. It's garbage yes. court. 
And they they managed to get uh, I think they managed to get a stay on the act. I'm not sure, um, but they did escalate this. this Where's people score? Fuck, shit. Just lobbing this, our trash logs over the Delaware. Just I just kept, take I take a lot of pleasure in knowing that like every single person in that courtroom is going in their head. You know how many years of law school led me to this? The garbage what? case. <laughs> it. Well, it escalated all the way up to the Supreme Court. Hmm. Holy shit. Yeah. And a case... Did we city, win? City of Philadelphia versus New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. Yeah. Was decided 7-2 in favor of Philadelphia. <laughs> Go the birds, waste control... <laughs> <laughs> the waste... <laughs> The Waste Control Act was an unconstitutional regulation on interstate commerce, and Philadelphia oh, had yes. a constitutional right to dump its garbage in New, Jer New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> the problem oh, was, <laughs> this decision was reached, I think, in like 1977. And by this time, the New Jersey landfills were almost full, right? Um, thanks Just to tamp it down a bit. <laughs> and they wouldn't approve any new ones, presumably. Yeah. yeah. The massive suburban sprawl in the decades prior to the decision left New Jersey landfill <laughs> operators unable to expand their landfills, um, so they needed to find some alternate destinations for the waste if it was to be landfilled without burning it, right? Because they had only limited space left in the existing landfills. And in the meantime, the incinerators kept churning out the fly ash, which again was sent to New Jersey, right? Um, I'm going to use the restroom. Because you, you had two beers, you blow, God baby. Sight. Yeah, I did. <laughs> How you doing, Liam? Oh, I'm terrific. I'm I'm on Google Maps, uh, just wandering around New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, thinking about landfills, thinking mm. about how fucking hideous and depressing they are. Yeah, I'm looking for my EPA challenge coin. I know it's in here somewhere. I got a um. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service challenge coin here. Oh, that's pretty sick. Protecting wildlife here and abroad. Thanks for making a difference. And it's like a here and abroad. North, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and each state has little um, like uh, animal in relief that I guess they were protecting. So North Carolina has some kind of bird. I think maybe an eagle. South Carolina has a turtle, and then Georgia has a rhinoceros. Oh, which... okay. Yes, the fi famous native. Yeah, of, uh, I, I was gonna say, I'm not sure if that, like, maybe I missed that class. But I, I, I too must have missed that class. Yeah, if, if you, if you, if you, the listener, can tell me what the fuck is going on with a, a Georgia rhinoceros being protected by the Fish and Wildlife Service, then, uh, then please do, and or send me some more challenge coins. I got hopelessly addicted to these things. Here we go. United States Environmental Protection Agency, Office of the Inspector General. And it's just like, the EPA's got a fucking, like, it came of age at the same time as the DEA, so it, they yes. have the kind of, like, 70s logo. Yes. Like, if you look up the EPA logo, like, especially in this kind of, like, one color thing that they have on here, it looks fully like someone has just stuck a lollipop in the ground in between two leaves. I'm back. We are talking about how bad the DEA logo is. In 1984, New Jersey officials had the fly ash, which was being brought across the bridge, tested for hazardous chemicals, right? Oh, and of course, and did they find some? Uh, they did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what were the odds? Why would you go in there? Turns out all this burned up household waste had cadmium, lead, mercury, and other nasties in there. No, the the sort of testing for hazardous chemicals and fly ash thing is very much like this feels at least a little disingenuous. Did, did you did you ever see that that old book cover that was identifying wood and it's a picture of a guy using like a jeweler's loop on a log of wood, and it's just like, yup, that's wood. Very similar mm -hmm. vibe. Well, so this is this is the interesting thing. They were trace amounts of all those chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were there. They weren't there in any huge quantity. So what's right. the fucking it's, it's problem? Kind of, it, well, <laughs> because New Jersey uses an excuse to ban it from their landfills. Stupid. This time constitutionally, right? <laughs> 
Motherfuckers. Yes. Um, and another landfill the city was using near Baltimore also closed uh, because they were unable to meet new EPA regulations around landfilling, right? Uh, so, you know, the city was kind of left with a predicament as to what to do with a small mountain of ash that was accumulating next to the East Central incinerator, right? Just leave it there. Put it there in a big heap like the Great Gatsby. Well, they were running out of space for the heap. Uh, oh. and, and use the, the ash to infill more land to put more ash. To get into the ocean. Ah. Well, okay, we're getting there. See on the boat. This is this is during the administration of uh, Mayor Wilson Good. Oh boy, um, America's uh, the Bonniest first mayor. <laughs> yes, <laughs> America's most domestic air warriest mayor. Yes. Um. So you know, Wilson Good, uh, fresh off the move bombing, contracts a company called Joseph Paolino and Sons. Oh. To find a place to dump the stuff, right? <laughs> Joseph Paola and Sons. Yeah. So they were refused at landfills in Virginia, West Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia. But they yeah, had probably because the rhinoceros. Yeah, they had a bright idea. They could send the fly ash to somewhere that d- didn't have an EPA. They're going to dump it on the third world. Yes. Oh, close enough. <laughs> yeah. Philly wins again. So the first idea is they're going to hire a company called Amalgamated Shipping Company of the Bahamas to uh, haul the waste to a man-made island in the Bahamas that the shipping company owned, and they would dump it there as landfill, right? Garbage island. Cool. Yes. So in September 1986, they set off in a ship called the Key and Sea from Philadelphia with 14,000 tons of fly ash from the incinerators, both the East Central and the Roxboro incinerator. Give me, um, give me an idea of scale here. How, like, how long had that been accumulating for? How much like, ash was building up? Well, if they're, if they're... Okay, so it's like six to a thousand. They're, mm-hmm. they're doing 600 tons of waste each day in one of those incinerators, probably 1,200 tons. have been sitting there for a long time. <laughs> I, I mean, the city had a couple of different landfills it could put it in, but two of its biggest ones closed. Mm. So, so I got this, this is a 466-foot, uh, 17-year-old at that time, Bolker, registered in Liberia, right? The captain was named Arturo Fuentes, right? And so they All start- of this seems incredibly above board. <laughs> That's like, yeah. the, most importantly, the vibe that I get from every single detail of this is so fucking legitimate. If I had to put a word on this, it would be legitimate. Yes. It feels <laughs> so legal and normal and uh, totally above board. So, the thing is, uh, Greenpeace gets on the case, right? Fucking hippies. Well, the fucking, fucking hippies Greenpeace. are here. Their toxic <laughs> trade team. France did not go too far enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're cancelled, boys. Oh, God. <laughs> of Listen. all the intelligence agencies that we thought Liam would get cancelled for endorsing, I did not think it would be the DGSE. But go off, King. That Listen, was I, I, I will, I will get cancelled for this, but there is there is some room for debate as to exactly how hazardous this fly ash is. Um Oh boy. <laughs> oh ooh. Yeah, I'm so, already gonna get yelled at for that yeah, joke, yeah, so, so whatever. But See you Green- in the comments, assholes. <laughs> Liam, you're being awarded the the quad the the fucking quad on now, the fucking of the Legion of France for this. It's about time. Yeah, uh, Francais par le sang Versailles. I'll take my citizenship <laughs> whenever you're ready. <laughs> yeah, technically, it says here you're now a colonel in the Foreign Legion. That's me. All right. So, Greenpeace please, please has- mail Liam a kepi. Actually, do I'll wear it. Oh, I heard that sigh. <laughs> 
So Greenpeace has what's called their toxic trade team. They track international shipments of toxic waste. Mm -hmm. And they were on the case here. They informed the government of the Bahamas that this ship was inbound. They were going to dump the fly ash on their private island in the Bahamas. And then they were going to, you know, they're just going to keep doing that. So the Bahamans block Key and C from entering Bahamian, Bahamian waters. Mm. Good for so, them. Yes. So the captain has to search for other locations to dump the ash, right? Um, so, guess, guess you could say he was really um, hauling ash. Hauling oh, ash, oh, yes. Oh. No, he was plodding around very slowly through the Caribbean with the ash. Oh. It's got 14,000 pounds. <laughs> right. So not driving fast and eating ash. H huh? Hauling, hauling 14,000 pounds of ash around is a big mood. 14,000 tons. 14,000, oh, whatever. I feel that. <laughs> yes. All right, so here we go. From late 1986 to August 1987, Key and C, C sails the Caribbean, searching for a place which will take the ash. Let me get my pen out here. All right, so we start in Philadelphia, sort of here. Dun, 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 sails dun, dun, down. Dun, sails down dun, to the, dun, the Bahamas dun, are up here, right? They can't get it, and they can't do it in the Bahamas. They sail to Bermuda. Mm -hmm. where's, where's Bermuda? By no, off North Labor Carolina, Pistons. bud. What? It's off North Carolina. Is it off North Carolina? Yeah, that's where Bermuda is. Is that this thing here? Oh, boy. It's a little too low res for me to tell you. Okay, so anyway, they sail to Bermuda, then they go that's down. That's good enough. They go down to the Dominican Republic to try and dump it. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. refuse there. Greenpeace is one step ahead of them each time. They go so to like fucking Carmen San Diego. It, yes. <laughs> they, they, they sail to Honduras, which I think is somewhere here-ish, right? Oh, boy. Then, <laughs> then they're like, well, all right. They go to uh, Guinea-Bissau. Yep. Yeah. Yep. They go all the way across the Atlantic, uh, somewhere around here, I think. They're refused there. They go all the way back to the Dutch Antilles. I don't know where that is. Um, somewhere back in the Caribbean again. So, and on the way, they slowly change the manifest of the ship uh, from fly ash to topsoil fertilizer. Hmm. Will yeah. it, in fact, fertilize your topsoil? No. Oh. <laughs> In January of 1988, the Key C reaches the port of uh, Gonavis. Gonavis? Gonavis? It's in Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or Haiti, um, if you prefer. Haiti, right. And two of Haitians... Uh, okay, so there's this guy, Lieutenant Colonel Jean-Claude Paul. He's, oh, he's, a, he's, a Haitian, <laughs> he's in the Haitian military. He's sort of your classic Caribbean corrupt drug dealing military guy right jesus christ roz yeah <laughs> no they were all cia agents oh, but know. like <laughs> exactly two of his cronies sign for the topsoil fertilizer i'm doing air quotes there topsoil fertilizer and the crew begins unloading the ash onto the beach right 4,000 tons of the ash are unloaded before the government gets wind of the situation. And um, they order the crew to reload the ash, right? Nope, dump it. It's your problem now. <laughs> well, yeah, because instead of reloading the ash, what they do is they just uh, set, they, they just steam away, right? <laughs> Nice. <laughs> During I'm, I'm, a burnout in my fucking 14,000 ton freighter. Wearing dreams with, and nightmares by Meek Mill. With a Haitian Navy escort. <laughs> <laughs> See I mean, dick holes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tell you that much, when a country's military is just kind of up for sale to the highest bidder, more than in the ways we already expect with defense contractors and stuff, mm -hmm. 
it may not be a good thing for your country, uh, but it does lead to some extremely funny moments, such yes. as this, or like any of the times in the like early history of the Russian Federation after after Gorbachev, where like the Soviet paratroopers were just like hiring themselves out as hitmen, so you'd have guys getting killed over like essentially the same thing over garbage disputes, but like. Uh, with nerve gas or like C4 under their chairs because like the only people killing people had been like trained to do this by the Soviet government for 50 years. All right. But the thing is, by this time, the, the captain of uh, Key and C, he's sort of given up at this point. He's not going to find a place to dump the ash. He's returning defeated to Philadelphia, right? Mm. With your sword, uh, with your shield or on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So he, he with returned. your fourteen thousand tons of fly ash or on them. <laughs> Listen, in fairness, he got rid of four thousand tons of them. With your <laughs> ten thousand tons of fly ash. <laughs> so he, he goes back to Philly to dump the ash on Pier Two, owned by Joseph Paolino and Sons, who we go the waste disposal company. They arrive back in Philadelphia. Um on February 29th, 1988, ready to repatriate the ash, right? They anchor in the Delaware and they wait for a berth to open up, right? And 3 a.m. that night, Pier 2 burned down. <laughs> Yo, oh. that's crazy. <laughs> wow. What are the odds? <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine the cat like, oh no. I can't believe it happened the way that it happened. Listen. <laughs> well, I'm going back to Haiti. <laughs> Joseph, <you guys. laughs> Joseph fucking Benno Celsich or whatever must have been so fucking upset about that. Yeah. Like, that was his um, peer. I was about to say, mad. He must be very, very mad. Absolutely. I, I checked. I had a hard time locating where Pier 2 is. Um, because Pier 2, yeah, as far no as Yeah, because no snitching. I, well, as far as I can tell, Pier 2 is uh, Schuylkill Pier. Um... And I believe it still is a waste transfer facility. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, all right, so Key and C is now anchored in the Delaware River under Coast Guard orders not to leave port at this point. He's yep. also, it's an international sensation too, this, this, this garbage barge, which, which can't unload the garbage anywhere. And they waited at anchor there for three months. And then one day, they just said, well, um, we have to go out to sea for engine trials, and left. <laughs> God damn it, Coast Guard! <laughs> so, he and C, at this point, they weren't really, they, 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 they left Philadelphia, crossed the Atlantic, they went to Senegal, right? Mm -hmm. They were refused there. <laughs> they went to Morocco. They were refused there. Then they disappeared. Until a suspiciously similar looking ship turned up in Yugoslavia. Oh. <laughs> they'd gone through the Mediterranean up there. Uh, they gave her a new coat of paint and a new name. Uh, Felicia. Registered huh. in Honduras. Right? Cool. <laughs> Now, Yugoslavia repainted and renamed the ship, but they would not take the fly ash. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're an accessory here. We're not fucking, like, <clears throat> getting your ash We're not going to take here. this, yeah. No, fuck off. So, they, um, so they're like, all right, all right, one last try. They leave Yugoslavia. They go through the Suez Canal all the way out. To what's the last third world country we can think of? Ah, Sri Lanka. Let's go there, right? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and Sri, Sri Lanka said, no, we're not no. taking this shit. The ship left again. And it was not seen until a few months later when it was spotted in Singapore in November 1988, once again renamed, now the Pelicano, but without the ash. Huh. So, what happened? Well, I got detained the, early the next year by the feds. They had renamed the boat again. It was now the San Antonio. <laughs> again, the vibes here, <laughs> so <Yeah>. legitimate. <laughs> the crew and the captain were brought in for questioning. 
And the captain eventually admitted that, yeah, we, we dumped the ash overboard in the Indian Ocean uh, with a front end loader. I mean, okay. Yeah. Didn't, didn't nice. really take Sherlock Holmes to figure that one out. But. Yeah. Well, he, he stayed quiet for a while until one of the crew members uh, uh, showed investigators some pictures and he was like, all right, yeah, I'll talk now, whatever. Betrayed <laughs> once again by the gram. Mm-hmm. No, I, yeah. I, like, I'm genuinely surprised they didn't do this sooner. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess that guy did not feel that his time was particularly valuable because he was like willing to try and offload this on they, like a good they dozen spent, countries. They spent 27 months at sea with this cargo. Jesus <laughs> Christ! I guess the cat, the captain's being paid hour, hourly. I don't think he has to care that much. Well, for him. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know the thing is, after this uh, after this incident, uh, no one was convicted or punished for the illegal dumping. International waters, we love to I, see it. Mm-hmm. I know, right? But the two officials for the shipping company were convicted of perjury and briefly jailed. Huh. So there is that. All right. The United Nations convened the Basel Convention banning shipments of toxic waste from developed countries to developing countries. Um, and 187 countries ratify this convention, but among those not ratifying were, of course, the United States <laughs> and a few developing <laughs> countries that we export toxic waste to. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Yeah. And in the meantime, the fly ash was still sitting on the beach in Haiti. That looks great. I know, right? Um, so Greenpeace starts something called Operation Return to Sender with the idea that this waste would be repatriated to the city of Philadelphia some way or another, right? Um, so they start a bunch of big public campaigns. I know in 1990, several groups in Haiti affiliated with Greenpeace started mailing envelopes full of fly ash to Wilson Goods' office. Um, that's cool. That's, I think that's funny. But... That is funny, yeah. Wilson Good didn't care. Um, Look, the guy, you think the guy who like bombs his own citizens with a helicopter <laughs> is gonna be... First of all, you think he opens his own mail, and second of all, you think he cares? I was about to say, yeah. Uh, no real action was taken until 1996, when the New York City uh, Trade Waste Commission finds out a company that they were licensing to haul commercial garbage uh, was operated by one Louis Paolino, right? Who was Employee a prince of the month. Yeah. He was a principal of Joseph Paolino and Sons. Of course, instigated <laughs> oh, all this. Oh, interesting how that works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting how the guy with the last name of the other guy is actually, I mean, I imagine he was one of the sons. Um, so he was a friend of ours. Yeah. So he was trying to haul commercial waste in New York City, and they decided, you know, We'll let you haul commercial waste on one condition. You gotta, you gotta clean up the waste in Haiti, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta think. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to commission a uh, or license a, a garbage uh, company that doesn't pick up after itself. Um, um, that is true. I appreciate the idea of like international sanitation commission guy. I was about to say, yeah, he's a you know principled internationalist. Yes. Yeah. You know, despite this, the company the company he owns uh, did didn't do shit about it for a while mm-hmm. until they were taken over by Waste Management Incorporated. <laughs> and in I have year- my own beef with Waste Management. They know what they did. Oh God, what did Waste Management do to you, Liam? Uh, you know what? We'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll save that for uh, for another episode. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, and in two the year two thousand. Waste Management Incorporated finally sent down a barge to pick up 2,500 tons of fly ash. Sorry, so that year again? Beach. What? So that year again? 2,000. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been sitting there for how long? It's been sitting there for 12 years. Cool. And they pick up 2,500 tons of fly ash, which is down from 4,000 tons on account of erosion. Right? On the basis that, like, well, it's all still there, but you can't ask us to go and fish it out of the water, so... Yeah, or the wind picked it up and, you know, Haitians breathed it in. Yep, Um, that problem. 
Yeah. <laughs> so they shipped it to Florida uh, en route to a landfill in Louisiana. And when Louisiana heard about it, um, lawmakers there uh, banned the ash from Louisiana. <laughs> Time is a flat <laughs> circle. <laughs> and this, this barge stayed at dock for two years until finally a landfill in Franklin County, Pennsylvania agreed to take the fly ash. That's two counties over from York, in case anyone's yeah. curious. Uh, they shipped it up there on a train, and the fly ash is there to this day. Um, Hooray. <laughs> so yeah, uh, they tore down the East Central Incinerator. They built Festival Pier there. Incineration and landfilling in Philadelphia today is kept within the four county area because that seems to be in, involve fewer international incidents. <laughs> um, however, Philadelphia never paid for the ash to be removed. Since the contract stipulated, the ash had to be disposed of legally. So this whole incident saved Philadelphia taxpayers $630,000. Nice. Yeah, which brought the savings into podcasting. Yeah. Hell yeah. I love how this is not even the first um, sort of US municipal uh, governance issue that causes an international incident. Because we've done the Vulcan Bridge and that also did. Yeah. <laughs> this is just, you would think it'd be easier to get rid of 14,000 tons of fly ash, but. What would do you no. want to take it? Uh, no. I don't have enough <laughs> do space. Do you know for anyone it. who wants to take it? <laughs> I'm going to be honest, like, uh, people try to really play up how toxic the stuff was. I don't think it was that toxic. I think, I think it was just people didn't the, want to store, like, have yeah, to deal with that the much problem landfill. problem is less the, like, lead and cadmium <laughs> stuff and more the, like, 14,000 tons aspect. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they pay you to take it, obviously, but, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't want to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, what's the moral of the story? Dump it further into New Jersey. Yes. <laughs> uh, f find different ways of disposing of trash that, other than like the big three of it being someone else's problem of ship it to New Jersey, burn it, or dump it in the sea. Uh, by uh, fuck it, I don't know. Use your imagination. Send it to space. Just fire it into the sun. That's probably good. I think. Well, I believe now we uh, landfill it up near Tullytown. Or we incinerate it in Chester. Mm. So, you know. No, I like the space thing. You should do the space thing. It's now waste to energy incineration, though. So, you know, that makes it mm. clean, right? Other than the fact that it's exactly the same and you just <laughs> add a turbine to it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, garbage. It garbage. Happens. We, pro yeah. we produce a lot of it, and um, uh, the thing is, right, we, we can't ever produce less of it. Impossible. Can't be no. done. Cannot do it. Cannot do it. Gotta have individually wrapped everything. Yeah, you gotta, it's, it requires a lot of personal responsibility, you know. You'd be one of those crazy people who, like, has, leads a zero-waste lifestyle. This, voluntarily. Yeah, impossible. <laughs> yeah. My god. I don't know. I mean, if, if if stuff was like made out of things which, you know, decomposed easily, you might not have to burn it at all. Maybe. Also, that would you probably could, burn better. Some kind of like, uh, so called. Uh, there's got to be a name for this sort of cycling stuff again. Oh. Uh, mm. oh one well, of these it was days, a beautiful. We'll, it was a beautiful dream, but like until well, then, we just have to burn it. We'll talk about Philadelphia's single stream recycling system another day. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, recycling's great. Just if, if only for the fact that like everything that you throw away that has a battery in it could just kill a guy. It's fun. Yes. Well, we have a segment on this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands for danger. Today we're gonna we're gonna talk about boilers. Um, oh also. no, no, <laughs> fuck, fuck. Okay, so if you're not familiar, um, the, 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 the boiler in my apartment, the hot water heater, 
is now so old that every time it breaks, which it does constantly, and I text my landlord and he's like, yeah, I'll send my cousin over to fix it. And the cousin gets over here and he's like, wow, they still make these? No, no, it's just, it's that old. Uh, it, it's got fucking, like, steampunk cogs and shit on it, and, like, it... Good lord. It's it's a Potterton Puma, if you want to, like, look up when that, that was sounds made. sounds like a sex ass. It sounds say. like a sex ass, it runs about as well as if you had just decided to use a sex ass to heat hot water. And, uh, yeah, no, about once every couple of months or so, it just fucking dies for whatever reason, because it's old, and uh, I don't have hot water uh, for however long at a time. It rules. Big fan of boilers. Well, our, our, our uh, incident involves a, um indirect heater and boiler system. Um, now, before I begin, I want to I mention this about Safety Third. A lot of people have been sending me very long and well-written safety thirds, and I, I like the well-written part. But could you please keep them keep them to about a page? Nope, <laughs> nope, not going to happen. <laughs> that's that's my only request. I would like about a page worth on a safety third, no more, <laughs> no less. All right, okay. Anyway, so now we start safety third. So my day job sees me helping oversee operations of a local heating company here in the Worcester Mass area. Worcester Mass! Worcester Mass! Now, in my line of work, it's not normally the customer and their actions that ends up mentally traumatizing the service technicians. In fact, mental trauma is not a normal thing, uh, but in this in this industry, right? I think I might be a close second by having a water heater that was full of water fall on me as we tried taking it out of a basement, but that's a different story. But unfortunately, in this case, that's exactly what happened. A few months back, one of the techs was out to do a cleaning with, for a customer, right? And noted two problems. One, the rele relief valve on the forced hot water boiler is seized shut and non-operational. Two, the coil in the indirect water heater has a pinhole in it. And so street pressure is bleeding over into the boiler. Now, so the way, the way this works is, right, we have an indirect heater and boiler, right? Where's my, there we go. So you have, you have a boiler. This is where the heat's coming from, right? And that's heating like a very hot water uh, thing, which goes to like a radiator or something, maybe a, heat exchanger with a forced air system, right? And then that comes back, cycles around. But in addition, that boiler also runs through a heat exchanger through the actual hot water heater. That's this guy here, right? And that, um, you know, the very hot water running through that coil heats the actual water that you use for your taps and your shower and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the same principle of operation as a nuclear reactor, right? You don't want to get your, your, spicy, your spicy water mixed up with your clean water. <laughs> yes, but in this case, instead of, uh, you know, there being Spicy a, water, it's just regular, it's like, regular greasy water. water. Yeah. Greasy water wow. from the oil burner, yeah. So, in this case, the heat exchanger, one of the valves, had a small hole in it, so that the high-pressure water in the water heater was leaking into the, the coil system, right? Um, so anyway, the tech ins uh, isolates the water heater by shutting off the ball valves on the two pipes that connected to the boiler. Press the easy five button. Yeah. He then draws off the pressure on the boiler by opening a purge valve, which is what you would open if you needed to purge a large, large amount of air out of the system to bring the pressure back down to a safe level. Right in this cast iron fired forced uh, cast iron oil fired forced uh, hot water system, the maximum is thirty psi. At which point the relief valve should open. But again, the relief valve is broken. That's the hot water circuit here, which is thirty psi, right? And that's the maximum that can be operated safely. Um, and then your your water heater itself is at a higher pressure, 
because it's getting water directly from the mains, right? Which is, I think he said 90 PSI later, right? Yeah, 70 to 90. 70 to 90. So the tech tells the husband that he has two problems, and at bare minimum, he needs to replace the relief valve on the boiler so the system is safe and won't risk blowing the boiler out. And the husband says, no, don't bother. Oh, boy. Yeah. So the tech calls me and explains the situation. With that valve stuck closed, you've got 70 to 90 PSI of street pressure hitting the boiler, basically creating a ticking time bomb if that water heater is opened back up and the system reactivated. I told them to leave the boiler off, keep the water heater isolated, and then if the customer insists on running it, we note it on the paperwork that it's run at your own risk, and then make him sign the paperwork. And he does all this, and he gets the customer to sign, so on and so forth. Well, lo and behold, right as the technician is cleaning up, the husband turns the entire system back on. <laughs> Gotta have hot <laughs> showers, I guess. I, yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's definitely, it's probably fine to run uh, a heating system at three times the pressure it's designed for. <laughs> when right? a guy tells me, hey, what, what you've created here is a bomb, and uh, if, if you switch it on, you, uh, you're going to start the countdown on that bomb, uh, obviously, what I do is I go, yeah, but I do want a hot shower, though. Yes. Well, lo and behold... Oh, excuse me, I already read that part. As it turns out, the water heater... What page would, of the future, folks? We're begging you. Yes. As it turns out, the water heater would be under the manufacturer's warranty. So I tell the husband that, and he just kind of fluffed it off and said he'd think about it, right? He joked it off? Yeah. He, yes. Yeah, yes. he jerked it yes. off. Yeah. He jerked it off, Alice. At this point, I noted the account and figured that there's nothing else I can do here. Fair enough. You're a, you're a, a boiler technician, not a cop. Yeah. You can't yeah, really, exactly. like, you can't tackle the guy. You can't tackle Fuck, the guy. You said what? <laughs> Stop putting the paperwork into his mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like he should have the authority to like you know take a valve off the system and just say no yeah. you can't you can't use this <laughs> you can't use this until it's fixed. <laughs> it's free country. If you want to blow yourself up, it's your house. Dude, pe people love like just not having safe or reliable high pressure hot water systems. You know, <laughs> mm, yeah. It's like what what's the what's the only thing in your house that's likely to blow up in a failure mode? Uh, the hot water heater. Uh, <laughs> what am I not going to do any maintenance on the hot water heater? <laughs> <laughs> so a month passes and I walk into work to find the foreman and the service manager panicking because we blew up a boiler. I ask one of the other office staff what, what happened. She tells me that the customer called wanting to swap the water heater. And when it was a light day, the service manager sends an installer over to swap the defective water heater that morning. The installer got to the house about half an hour before I showed up to work. He had to go pick the water heater up from the supply house. He walked in, knowing someone was on their way to get help. Uh, knowing someone was on their way to help get the new water heater into the basement and the old one out, right? Now, bear in mind, this is a 45-gallon indirect uh, water heater. It's only about 60 pounds at most, and one person can move it on their own, but it's a bitch to bring it down the basement stairs solo. So the mm. installer figures he'll go in and at least get it started. Um, now, the wife mentioned to the uh, technician that uh, pipes have been banging since we had them uh, had been at the property a month prior. Right? <laughs> when you told them that if they reactivate the thing, it will explode. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, if you're hearing water hammer frequently, that's a bad sign. <laughs> so, the installer takes one look at the temperature and pressure gauge on the boiler and saw that the pressure was holding at 80 PSI at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've, uh, I've, I see now I've walked into a scene from the Hurt Locker. 
<laughs> just start giving boiler technicians the EOD suit. Oh my god. He didn't he didn't get to take another step before shit went south. Yeah. As he was standing in front of the boiler, it blew out from the pressure. Now thank God it didn't go on an all directions trip into the realm of the honorable ancestor, because then we'd mm-hmm. be dealing with a far worse situation. But a chunk measuring six inches long and two inches wide rocketed out of the back of the rear section through the boiler's jacket and into the foundation behind the boiler. Yep. Water and steam were going everywhere. The boiler going off shook the house and significant emotional events were had by all present in the house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to know how quickly that technician moved out of the basement. Well, I would assume very. Mm. So I was told he all was this. He was hauling ash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was told all this and already remembered the house. I looked at the service manager and asked him what we were doing. Service manager says, we're doing the block at cost because we fucked this up. And the first words out of my mouth were, did you bother reading the slip from the last guy or looked at my notes? <laughs> and I got a dumb look from him and the foreman. So I pull up the account, point out the notes, then pull the service history on the account, and the same thing is noted there. I pulled the slip and gave it to both of them. Um, not only did the tech note what he said, but he put a note on the slip after he got it in the van that the customer had brought the system back online as he had watched them shut it down. So the foreman goes to help swap the block out, and I managed to probably save the last technician's job from a heated moment pink slip. End of the day, the wife calls me and asks what would have happened if the husband had listened to the last tech. I told her point blank, point blank that they wouldn't have had to pay to swap the boiler block for one, but he's also lucky that he's not looking at a police investigation. She asked me why, and I told her, The fact that the boiler didn't take everyone out in the basement was a miracle. I've seen what exploding boilers do to basements, and by my own estimation, they turn any any living thing to paste on their way through the basement. So while I'm sure that the installer is likely not going to want to go back to the house after that day, they should count their blessings that this just cost them money and only took out a chunk of their basement wall. And of course, the wife's response was that the husband had, you know, slept through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, two months after his stupidity paid itself off. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's damn lucky to just have yeah. a. D- yeah, what what did you do at work today? Yeah, I I, I dodged a I bomb going dodge, off. Yeah, I dodged a high pressure steam bomb. I, yeah. do, I, I dodged an IED that a guy set up right. for me in his basement. I did not get Boston Marathoned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, incredible. Well, in the Boston Marathon, also get your fucking explosives. Yeah, it was a pressure cooker bomb. Uh, yeah, yeah, get get your fucking boiler inspected. Regularly, yeah. and then don't if turn you, it back on if someone don't tells you. Don't turn it back yeah. on when the guy so, tells some, you. The guy tells you not to turn it back on. You should not turn it back on. Yeah. Also, if your pipes, if you're hearing like <laughs> in all of your pipes, that's not a Phil Collins record. Regularly, <laughs> yeah. My next door neighbors back when I lived in uh, uh, Virginia, we we lived in like a townhouse. It was like a '70s townhouse, though. So you know, it had you know paper thin walls. They did some uh, stuff to the plumbing in their um, in their house at some point, and then we just constantly heard water hammer in the uh, in in the living room of our house. You know, oh, good. I was like, yeah, hmm. just forever. I was like, well, this is I didn't know shit about water hammer back then, but now I'm like, that's probably pretty bad. <laughs> um, the fact that that house didn't, you know, at some point just, uh, you know. Go inundate and itself with yeah. water is is bizarre. Mm. But uh, yeah, that was safety third. Shake hands with danger. So they uh, really 
really did in this case. Like the, the I feel yeah. like the drop is merited for the like, so. pre previous safety thirds have not had this. Like uh, getting getting your ship bombed by the French Air Force, you didn't really shake hands with danger. Danger, danger just decided to give you the reach around. But like in this case, this is fully a guy knowingly uh j just yeah, shaking hands with danger. Yeah, but the other technician who went down and, and looked at the 80 PSI pressure gauge, he, mm -hmm. he was probably not prepared for that. No, no. <laughs> they should give him, like, the fucking, like, explosives ordnance disposal pin, I was about metal. about to say, yeah, they should give, give, him yeah. A, give him employee of the month at least. <laughs> give him a raise. Give, give him something. Yeah. You know, it, the customer is not always right. No, Freeman, no. the customer is a goddamn moron. The, the customer is a goddamn moron, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, our next episode is going to be on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster. Yeah, anyone... another great example of what happens when you don't maintain your boilers. Does anyone have any commercials? Uh, listen to my other podcasts, Trash Future and Kill James Bond. It's very good. They're both very good. We have Patreons. You can give me money. I like money. I need it for things. <laughs> yes. Uh, money. Good. Also, continue to like mail the PO box stuff. Just weird shit. I appreciate uh, that a lot. Yeah, sure you do. Let me, let me let me get some some fucking weird vintage militaria in the PO box for for, you're paying for shipping for, for that. Yeah. If, if you're gonna <laughs> mail us like huge amounts of food in bulk. Could could you give us like stuff that you know we we we, we can like it's actually, cold are, are actually going yeah I don't I don't know if I I can do that many peas or that many chickpeas <laughs> Ross do you <laughs> want some jelly beans um, <laughs> just send send them a baker bucket I would <sighs> I, I would I would take some black beans or maybe some pinto beans I think do you that want the chickpeas or do you not want the chickpeas I don't yeah, know if I can make that much peas. yeah I was about to say. Um, I don't know if I can make that much falafel. <laughs> 14,000 tons of hummus <laughs> schlepping yeah. around the Caribbean. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the Israelis uh, strike again. <laughs> yeah, you thought, BDS, you thought. <laughs> <laughs> the Israelis sending us uh, chickpeas, so we will... Yeah, um, we have a, yeah, just remote cancellation. We get cancelled for getting a giant shipment of Sabra hummus. Yeah, we, we're going to get a 40-foot shipping container full of Sabra hummus, and on the side <laughs> it's going to be painted. Actually, those settlements are not a clear violation of international law. Hey, check it out, guys. We all got soda streams and a Desert Eagle. <laughs> Yeah, you get you Actually, get I would take a deagle. If you could yeah. mail that, do not attempt to do this. Do not attempt to, I cannot stress enough. Do not attempt to do that. Hey, I'm reverse. not sure what you kind get... of paperwork you would have to do to make the P.O. box a registered firearms dealer. I like the concept of reverse BDS where the Israeli government just starts shipping you random crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we did a podcast. We did a we did, podcast. We did a podcast in only right. an hour and 33 minutes. All right, bye, everybody. Yeah, bye. I was about to say, off you <laughs> soon.